Today's guest is Justin Rice, the VP and Head of Ecosystem at Stellar Development Foundation. This is the development foundation for Stellar Blockchain. Recently, Stellar has a $100 million platform that they're going to be giving out to developers to build on Stellar. We discussed what the pros and cons, the risks, the challenges of allocating capital into the marketplace of developers to build on your blockchain. Stellar is not the only foundation that is doing this. This is a common practice. Of course, $100 million is a lot to give out. And I'm sure that's going to spark a lot of creativity and development on Stellar. We discussed really the patterns of the foundation. So what are the challenges? How are decisions made internally? What does it really look like to be ins inside of a foundation for a blockchain? Very much enjoyed this conversation. I hope you do as well. If you do, please give us a thumbs up, like, share, wherever you're listening to this podcast. Here is Justin Rice. Justin, thanks so much for hopping on the podcast today. I'm super excited to meet with you, get to know you, and learn more what you're working on at the Stellar Development Foundation, which is supporting Stellar, the technology infrastructure. I'd love to learn just for a second about your background. Where did you get involved in Stellar? What were you doing before and sort of what led into the role that you're currently at now? Yeah, I've had a, my career has zigged and zagged all over the place. For a long time, I worked in commercial production, like on, on shoot, helping to shoot movies and, and TV shows and television commercials. Then for a long time, I was in the music industry. I was in a band. We recorded records. We went on tour. Eventually, I ended up working in tech, in technology. I worked for OkCupid, which is a popular dating website. And while I was working there, someone that I'd known for a really long time was building a front-end application on Stellar and was basically needed some help with the product side. And it was like, okay, we're trying to build a DEX interface for Stellar and we're building it from nothing. And can you just come in and help us like sort of figure out how to make it user-friendly and then also how to like sort of work with the various people in the Stellar ecosystem whose assets will appear on the exchange in order to have them like sort of meet standards. And that was about five years ago. So I worked on Stellar X for a year and then moved in to work for the foundation about four years ago. And I ended up here, I think, because you know, for me, the, the whole world of blockchain is exciting because it's, it's kind of greenfield technology. It's a place where we're figuring out the rules, we're figuring out the product market fit, we're figuring out what it is that we can do to change the world. And a lot of the, there are a lot of big questions and not very many answers. And so for me, there's like a huge intellectual challenge that kind of sucked me in. What does it mean to use distributed ledgers to track value? What does it mean to sort of try to provide access to people in the world who don't have it? How does that interact with current financial technology? What kind of impact can you have? And so, yeah, it was sort of the intellectual, intellectual challenge and the potential to have impact that brought me into blockchain. And five years in blockchain is basically like a lifetime. So I've sort of see, seen a lot and I'm still very interested. And, and how do you think of the conceptual positioning of Stellar relative to the other technical infrastructure out there? Like, where where is Stellar carving out a niche? Stellar has been around for a really long time for blockchain. I mean, it initially launched in 2014. The current network launched in 2015. It's processed over 10 billion transactions. And initially, Stellar was designed to be a very, it was very purpose-built. There was a limited repertoire of transactions and it was really focused on payments and specifically on cross-border payments. And so over the first five years of the network, a lot of the goal was to try to get money transfer operators, fintech companies, wallet builders, asset issuers of like sort of key stable coins that are collateral backed to actually use the network. And the goal was to connect all of these disparate payment systems across the world in order to have a platform that allowed for like universal payments and universal asset conversion. So Stellar was really purpose-built for payments, was specifically there to help. The foundation has, has a mission to connect, to, to provide equitable access to the world's financial infrastructure. And so the goal was universal payment platform that connects locally to all the different currencies to allow sort of universal uniform transactions and asset conversion. Okay. Since then, though, I'll say that we recently, like, so Stellar was not built with smart contracts. It was built with this limited repertoire of transactions. And over the past year, we have been bootstrapping or building a new sort of uh, a thing called Sorabon, which is a smart contracts platform 
that will bring smart contract functionality to Stellar. And so in the past, it was about this limited repertoire and working with sort of people, organizations, businesses that are interested in, in sort of money transfer. Now we are also starting to engage the world of DeFi to connect those two things. So we will sort of be offering all of these on and off ramps, all this access, all this connection to traditional financial infrastructure, and then embedding within it the ability to actually build DeFi protocols and dApps and offer users the advantages that those that DeFi has. Interesting. So the, the on and off ramp seem to be a big part of the, the uniqueness of the value prop. Is that different than what would be an example of that? Say I'm, I'm thinking of an exchange as a place where I have my money in a bank account, say a U.S. bank account. I'm sending an ACH or wire to, if I send it to Binance or Kraken or something, they have a U.S. bank that they're associated with and they reconcile that. And then you have the money, show, you have the U.S. dollar show up in your exchange wallet, but really it's in a bank that is partnered with the exchange. In the case of Stellar, is there a peer-to-peer -peer component of on and off ramps or how is that, how is that handled? It, yeah, I mean, the easiest... And clearest example is MoneyGram. So MoneyGram inter interoperates with Stellar. That means that you can walk into a MoneyGram location with cash. You can put cash on the counter and they will give you a balance of USDC in your Stellar wallet. There is no interaction with an exchange. There is no interaction. It doesn't require a bank account. MoneyGram, they have a whole network of agents that do ensure that sort of like deposits or payments or deposits into MoneyGram or deposits into Stellar are, are done in compliance with local laws and regulations. But it's actually a huge difference, right? Like the example that you're talking about requires a lot. It requires a bank account. It requires the ability to interact with the crypto exchange. It requires there to be a crypto exchange that is licensed and operates in your jurisdiction. Those are things that a lot of the world doesn't have. Like I have easy access to that. Sounds like you do too. But many people in the world that live in a cash economy don't. So can you get into, into like sort of crypt, into the crypto space with cash? Yes, with Stellar. You can walk into MoneyGram cash on the counter, end up with a digital balance in your wallet. And unlike the exchanges, as you pointed out, where the exchange is actually sort of custodian of the funds, in the MoneyGram example, you're actually getting that value in a wallet that you control. Mm. Yeah, that's a good way to describe it. And wh what's the positioning between Stellar, the technology, which is open source and distributed and people can contribute to it. And there's like a, a common, common pattern to that infrastructure development started obviously with Bitcoin and the development foundation, similar to other projects, and you tell me how this is not exactly accurate, but it's a, a portion of the initial tokens that are allocated, which are a portion to a foundation. And that might be usually it's in the low digits or low double digits. And that that money is managed by a group of people who allocate it, give it in grants to developers to build on the ecosystem. So it's, it's the incentive for the foundations, speaking broadly about foundations, not Stellar specifically, but they are money in the pot that is given strategically to people who are building. And, and usually it's used to fund the development agency that is like the that's like the, the spark plug for the engine. It's like the thing that gets the thing going because you need early developers who are paid consistently that can build the technology. Can you tell me what the maybe early purpose of, if that is exactly what Stellar is, then I'm curious what the later purpose of the foundation, just about foundations generally, maybe what you've learned, what the challenges are, maybe what the hopes initially and, and learnings have been. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty good description of, I think, how foundations for that support layer one technologies work. And so in the case of the Stellar Development Foundation, initially Stellar was an idea that a bunch of engineers worked on, but the purpose was not for them to own the output of that work. It was to create a common infrastructure that is, as you said, open source. So anyone can actually view the code and contribute to it. Open participation. Anyone can use it or build on it. No permission required. And but, so it is, it is an interesting thing where you start out by building infrastructure that you don't intend to own, that you sort of, that you sort of offer with a, a, an open source license to the world. The foundation, it is, it is accurate to say that like the foundation does, there, there, there are lumens, which are the, the native currency that you use on Stellar to cover transaction fees or gas fees, and also to basically cover minimum requirements. If you have an account on Stellar, you have to have a minimum balance basically in order for it to exist on the ledger. That's sort of the purpose of, of, of lumens. Those lumens are 
were created on day one. There, there's no mining on Stellar. So they were created day one, pre-mined. And the foundation started with the, with like sort of all, all of the lumens, but those lumens don't actually belong to the foundation, right? There is a very public mandate to give them away in a very structured way that we do it. And we actually publish exactly the lumen allocations, what we're spending them on and the wallet addresses for each of the different buckets of our, of our mandate on our website. So if you go to stellar.org slash foundation slash mandate, you can see the, the sort of lumens that we have to distribute. You can see what their purpose is. And, and so one of the goals of the foundation is, yeah, to take, to distribute those lumens in a way that sort of helps to bootstrap the ecosystem that helps to support the growth and development of the network. We do it not because we are trying to make a profit, right? It, SDF, the foundation, which I'll call SDF from now on, Stellar Development Foundation. SDF is a, a nonprofit. We don't have shareholders. Our goal is our mission, right? So it is to, to, to provide equitable access to the world's financial infrastructure. And so the allocation of those lumens to bootstrap the network is mission driven. And so I think that is one of the big purposes, right? The foundation helps sort of shepherd the technology. It helps distribute funds in order to bootstrap the ecosystem and to achieve the mission. And then also the foundation serves as a, as a connector between different people in the ecosystem. So we help build mutual relationships between counterparties that are building on the network. We help to define standards for using the network so that everyone's kind of doing it in a uniform way that allows for interoperation. And then finally, we serve as sort of a speaking partner to legislators and regulators. So it is helpful to have a sort of actor within the ecosystem who is interested overall in, in ensuring that there's good education happening for the people who may affect policy that, that, that sort of determines the, the shape of the entire industry. I, I think that it's important to note that like SDF is one player in, in a broader ecosystem, an ecosystem that includes asset issuers, wallet builders, DAP developers, protocol developers, an ecosystem that includes educators, a community of people who are like sort of enthusiasts, supporters. It includes input from aid organizations that are using Stellar Aid Assist to distribute aid. All of these different organizations make up the ecosystem and we are a, a player. And so our goal in many ways is really to facilitate the growth of that ecosystem, not, not to own the technology. And because it's an open ecosystem, like anyone can participate. So I'd say we're a big participant but just one participant of many in, in the ecosystem that surrounds the technology. And the, I, I totally resonate with the idea of being mission driven. I want to better understand the, the financial incentives. So individuals that are working on the project that are contributing to the open source that are not being paid directly by the foundation, are they putting aside the people who are just doing it for their own and donation base, right? There's people who are just spending free time doing it because they want that to exist in the world. But for people who are contributing meaningful hours throughout the week to the project, are they owning a portion, are they owning lumens and hoping that the value of lumens goes up? And for people who are working ac across those various titles, is that the general financial incentive that, that gets them excited is, Hey, we grow this thing together. It's going to be worth more in the future than it is today. And, and that'll benefit me and my family. Is that the, like. Is that the general attitude or think how people think about it from a financial incentive? I think that, that this would be a really good question to ask all the various builders that are working on Stellar. My answer is that I think most of the people that are building projects on Stellar are actually interested in creating products and services that serve end consumers. And generally they have some sort of business plan in mind for how using this infrastructure allows them to offer better, more competitive, cheaper, faster, or products and services to consumers or they and or they are like building products and services that can reach consumers that they wouldn't otherwise be able to reach, right? So if you imagine going back to this idea of you can actually cash into Stellar, that means that it is a blockchain that touches the cash economy in a way that many others don't. Well, what if you what what is that? What sort of greenfield is that for you or for for a, a builder? Can they think of a product that they're excited about that either generally, ideally, there's sort of a business use case for it, but also. Oftentimes people who are interested in reaching underserved populations also have a similar mission in mind to the one that we at the foundation have. So I think it's like builders are building things that have value and the network is the infrastructure that allows them to do it. And so it's in their interest to sort of help that network thrive and grow. Mm -hmm. And it's in their interest to see the ecosystem 
like also grow so that there are more a counter more other products and services or assets that they can interoperate with. So mm -hmm. I think it's it's kind of like we we there is a collective desire to see the network succeed because that makes it more functional. And the people who are building on, on it have an idea in mind of how that functionality will allow them to create a business that 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 will serve some sort of need. And so I, I think a lot of it is like sort of this business mindset driven. Right, right. That makes sense. And if you were to, say, hypothetically, start a foundation today on a sizable blockchain, what do you think... What, what would what would you do differently? Not necessarily different from Stellar, but different than the pattern of all foundations on on blockchains. Is there some learning you think that that you've had, or you think that there's consensus around with how to issue tokens, how to manage the money, how to deploy the money, how to screen the developers? Like one example is, I was talking to I forget who it was, but somebody that works in a foundation might have been at Tezo, and he was saying that there's a lot of developers who will go around to multiple projects. And they'll contribute an idea. They'll submit an idea for a grant. And a grant is free money. There's no equity exchange there. And they'll submit it to five different blockchain ecosystems and get three different grants. And they like kind of drag their feet and fizzle out. And effectively, it's a form of fraud. And I wonder about that, right? Because that doesn't seem sustainable. It seems like there's like leeches on the system taking advantage of the way that money is distributed through these foundations. Just curious if there are things that stand out to you as learnings you may have had or gaps you think are still existing problems in how the structure of open source technology is built paired with a foundation. I think one of the most interesting things that we've learned doesn't necessarily relate to like fund allocation. It relates to trying to figure out what it is that a foundation can or should build itself and where it should leave space in the ecosystem for a third party to build it. Like an interesting thing about Stellar is that from the very beginning, the, the, there's, there was sort of the, the Stellar stack included Stellar Core, which is kind of a transaction system that includes the consensus protocol and the sort of specified features that allow people to actually interact, you know, that, that, that runs the network, right? But the foundation also built an API layer on top of that. It's called Horizon. And from the beginning, in an attempt to make things easier on the ecosystem, we just offered a public Horizon endpoint, and it's still alive and kicking today. And in so doing, I think that we, we inadvertently prevented a lot of infrastructure providers who may actually provide that service as a business from entering into the ecosystem. And so I think one lesson that we learned is like, okay, that, that made sense, right? We wanted to, there's this conflict, right, between, or trade-off, I guess, between making things easy right? And, and trying to get full ecosystem participation, you're always trying to figure out like, what, what, what can we do? And what should we sort of clear out and let other people do? And I think the decision to build that API layer from the beginning, it made a lot of sense. It helped Stellar grow. It helped us get to where we are, this 10 billion transactions, right? But now we run into a, a, a situation where there's, where we're trying to like reduce dependence on that, on that API endpoint. And as we're launching this new smart contracts protocol, Sorbon, one of the things that we realized is that it will have a new set of, of sort of service layer infrastructure, RPC nodes that allow people to actually interact with and submit smart contracts. And so one of our goals now, one of the lessons we've learned is like, from the beginning, let's not, let's make sure that any provision of that service that the foundation provides, like it's sort of a free service, takes into, like doesn't actually prevent others from entering the ecosystem and providing it. And so I think for me, it's like trying to, put the lesson is think hard about the trade-offs between creating something yourself and that, or leaving space for other people to provide that service. And the more, as Teller becomes like, as the ecosystem grows and then as the technology sort of continues to be reliable and continues to reach more parts of the world, I think we're learning to be better at getting at helping other people actually build on the network and sort of reducing our role in some of the places where before early on we were we were very active so it's it's kind of like you got to learn how to like seed control us like provide the right environment for people to grow and for them to find opportunity and then i think that the distribution of funds to support them as they do is is one of the tools right but ultimately, I think what you're looking for is an ecosystem where people actually have their own business incentives to create a product or service. That includes infrastructure service provision, 
but also apps or, or assets that exist on the network. And you want to help them. You want to like sort of support people who have this in mind. I have an idea for how to use this, this infrastructure to build a product or service. And I know how, I know how it's going to work. I understand my motivation for doing it. Those are sort of the people that you look for. And yeah, you can help, help them sort of de-risk the cost of building by giving them a grant, but the grant shouldn't be what sustains them. It's sort of what helps them get going. And in the end, you are looking to, to support organizations, businesses, individual developers who like have a mindset where they want to be independent. Yeah. Interesting. So it sounds like not clogging the airways, so to speak, like you're, you're thinking of, of, of philosophically creating the app store, not creating the single app that people have to use. Maybe that, I don't know, that analogy doesn't squarely fit, but like conceptually speaking. If it's pretty well, if it's pretty well. And the difference is that like that app store, there's no, it doesn't charge 30% to the developers to yeah. actually use it, right? Like it's not only free to use, but the actual developers can like get some sort of funding in order to actually start to build their app. So I think it's, it's that that's exactly right. It, it, it is creating an app store, but take away all the overhead and just like, that's that is kind of mm. yeah maybe it's more like a shopify app store instead of an apple it, being that there's a right. there's a primary revenue stream that's sustainable for the money issuer which in this case is is sdf in the it's interesting like shopify for example free to build apps on shopify but shopify charges your customers so it'd be almost to say in a similar way if i use stellar as a consumer i'm paying a transaction fee and that goes into the stellar ecosystem SDF indirectly is being funded by that, right? The more people that use, is that not right? So is there... No, transaction fees don't... Transaction fees are, are, are don't go to SDF. They don't go to anyone. They, the transaction fees are there to like sort of incentivize considerate usage of the ledger and to prevent spam, right? Any network mm -hmm. of accounts that stores data can... People can just start spamming it. And that starts to... You start to run into problems in terms of the longevity of the infrastructure because databases get really big. And it starts to be like annoying because people spamming your account with is not a good user experience. So the transaction fees are there to discourage like sort of bad usage of the ledger at scale, but they don't actually go to support the foundation or anyone. They get burned. Does the foundation have a, does the pot get filled or, or is it just from whatever was initially allocated in 2014, 2015, or is there a source of new funding that comes into the foundation? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I think our our finance team would definitely be in a, in a better position to answer it. I mean, the network itself does not kick back any benefits, any sort of financial benefits to to the foundation or to anyone. Right? It 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 is infrastructure that people use, and the funding for direct development, which is the the mandate bucket that that is used to like sort of support the foundation's efforts is was there from an initial lumen allocation it doesn't that that bucket doesn't refill mm -hmm. yeah okay that makes sense so it's like again by analogy because it's not a, it's a non-profit not for but like if i'm raising a fund to invest in startups i would raise 50 million dollars and then i'd write a series of checks that fund that bucket would run out and then i have to go raise another fund so think of this like this is like a it's like a jump starter fund is SDF and the recent allocations that have been made into Coral and others, they've been out of that, that bucket. And that doesn't sound like that gets refilled as part. It doesn't get sourced from Stellar. It doesn't get, Correct. yeah, ref maybe there's yeah. donations or something it, that people could make. I don't, I don't know if that, I mean, do you see the SDF as being something that is just destined to just die out? It's just like a, a fund that will eventually spend all the money, sail into the night, and then the ecosystem will be flourishing. That's a really good question. I mean, that's not a bad outcome, right? If over time, the, the need for there to be a foundation to support the technology is because there's a whole ecosystem that is, that it's self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. That's a good outcome, right? We, we still have a, a, a enough funding left. And again, you can look, it's public. So you can look at the direct development fund our our allocation right it, on our on our mandate page and you can see that it's it's this is not a this is a problem for the future not for for right now and so it's really hard to say okay in 
what is the fate of the foundation in five years and 10 years? Like it's, it's hard to say because I think that the fate of the foundation is contingent entirely upon how successful we are at sort of realizing our mission and building out a vibrant ecosystem. And so there's just so many, so many variables and so many different possible futures. But the one that you described, right, is I, I would be happy if we achieved our mission and our, and the scope of our role reduced because what we, it wasn't as necessary for us to be as active in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But you know, I don't, I don't know what, what will happen to be honest. Yeah. You like, could it, I, like, to me, it's, it, it, I could see double-edged sword here, right? Like say, say transaction fees did go to its foundation. You have some percentage of, of value lumens that are going from the protocol itself into a bucket, a foundation, maybe it's 5% that are then used to like spark new innovation on the protocol. So there's like this, the government does this, we're going to tax you and then we're going to give it to research development and health at NASA and everything else. And maybe that creates something that sparks the internet or space travel or something else. Like NASA seemed mm -hmm. to be the precursor to SpaceX, which is a for-profit company that came on the backs of a nonprofit organization that was funded by taxpayers who contributed a portion of their money. So conceptually, the thing makes sense. It opens the door to the other side of the sword, which is like corruption, which is, hey, I give it to this. Who knows who's allocating it? What, the, you could make it, it could be dark. It could be you, $10 million given to this organization and then they never go anywhere and whatever happened to that. So I could, I could see, and that happens in the government too, right? The, just, these are just ways of organizing people and funds, whether it's the government or whether it's a decentralized project with a foundation. There's just different structures for doing a, a, by analogy, a similar thing which is taking a portion of the growth and then reallocating it into new, new projects. So I, I think I'd say that to just say it's, it's interesting to consider the different ways that the foundation, the light side and the dark side of how it can, how it can work. Yeah. I mean, I think that first of all, any change to the way that say transaction fees work on Stellar or where they go, it's not something that the foundation has control over, right? Um, it, on Stellar, key network decision, in addition to validating transactions, like the actual validators that make up the network, the people that, the, 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 the organizations that run computers that actually decide, or that actually review and append, create blocks, add blocks, review transactions programmatically and confirm them and, and update the ledger, right? They also have control over network governance. And so there's a whole series of things that they, 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 they vote on. Right. So the version of the Stellar protocol, the minimum requirements for base reserve. So like the, the, the minimum requirements basically for, for holding a Stellar account, transaction fees, the number of transactions per ledger. These are like all network settings that validators actually control through, through programmatic voting. And so any change to like how things worked, like fees, the foundation couldn't just make, mm -hmm. right? The, the validators, the people that participate in the network actually decide there's actually a governance model. And so I think that governance models, this is one of the great things about distributed decentralized technology is that there, you can build in governance models that keep things on it and it give participants the ability to actually weigh in and control outcomes. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a really good point. This is a place where there's definitely a clear distinction between the foundation, a participant who helps boost the network and the network itself, where governance is not, where governance is determined by the people who actually run validators to participate in the network. So like any decision about any of those key decisions, like we, the foundation don't make them. The ecosystem as a whole participates to, to decide what's due. Mm, interesting. I, I, I'm curious, just to get your quick feedback on this. So obviously S SBF and the fall of FTX is like, there's massive collateral damage from that. And that seemed to be not a technology issue, but a fraudulent related issue to moving money around and bank accounts and that sort of thing. Then there's the bridges which is a technical issue. So like people, bridges getting hacked and there's technical weak points in the, in the, in the open source infrastructure, or maybe it's not open source, but the, the technology infrastructure layer. And I think I'm trying to think where are the, where are the weak points in the system and is a found, are the foundations, not stellar specifically, but like, would it be shocking to see in the next couple of years, a similar sort of exploit happen in the foundation layer? Like, cause to me, it seems like the foundation layer is a point where there's a, a few people who make a big decision on the distribution of funds. It's the point where ha a year, a year ago, if you were to say, well, 
whoever runs these exchanges, there's a few people who run the exchange and can make the decision about where the money can move. That's a, that's a point of concern or a, a, a point where there could be somebody who takes advantage of it. And obviously somebody did. Do you think foundations have a, again, not stellar specifically, but from your vantage point, do you think there's a, like a, a weak point or a point of concern where there, I would love to prevent something like that from happening on the foundation layer to not have to learn the hard way from some foundation abusing the power and that sort of thing. I'm just curious your reaction to that idea. I think it's really important that foundations, and actually, I think this is generally true for the sort of crypto and blockchain ecosystem. I think transparency is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And so, for instance, again, we, we this SD, the Stellar Development Foundation, we, we have a, a, we publicly display the funds that we are distributing. And so anyone can like actually see that we are doing what it is that we say that we intend to do. And so that level of transparency, which is something that this sort of open nature of blockchain allows is something that we as an industry should expect and lean into. And so I think if you're trying to evaluate whether someone's an honest actor, a lot of the times I think you should be able to look at the transactions, you should be able to look at the record, right? And say, are they acting honestly? And so I think that helps to build faith. There's a similar like sort of idea in the Stellar ecosystem where asset issuers that issue stable coins on Stellar, the general ecosystem standard is that they are expected to publish third-party attestations of reserves. So USDC publishes a monthly attestation of reserve from Grant Thornton, right? And so this like sort of level of expectation, again, it's not at the foundation level, it's at the issuer level, but it, it's a similar kind of thing. I think transparency, 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 that's the way to keep people, to, to like sort of keep people informed, make sure that people are honest, that organizations act honestly. And honestly, like I think for us, it's really important to do that because we want feedback from the ecosystem. Like we... No, like we are, we are out there trying to support people and encourage them to build on this underlying infrastructure. And in order to do that, it's like crucial that we actually know what they think we should do. Right. And so beyond just transparency, I think it's also engagement. So we're transparent, we're engaged. We have a ton of interaction with the various people who are actually the builders on our technology. And by doing that, the goal is to like, sort of make sure that we're Clear that, that, that we're aligned with the ecosystem as a whole. And I think that's like the expectation, right? Not just for foundations, but for organizations. If you're working in, the, the, in an open source, open participation, public blockchain, you got to use that, that the public nature of it yeah. to like sort of make sure that you create alignment and that you are held accountable for the decisions that you make. Yeah, yeah there's a real benefit that you get from that, which is the feedback from the community and the increase in trust that you get from being transparent. I think that the, that's the antibodies to the, 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 like the tendencies for people to cover it up or like Celsius, like we're transparent, we're, we're, we're safe as a bank and like behind the scenes, all sorts of shady stuff happens. So I, you're, that, I think you made a really good point about having, it, having a third party trusted auditing firm is actually a really useful player in the space. Because there's like, there's a lot of built up trust in the institutional layer. And that's, while it may not be a computer represented trust factor, it's highly valuable. I want to ask you, Justin, about the, the recent investments. So the SDF has made some big investments over the last few months. Can you tell me what's been most exciting for you and how the projects have come about? Yeah. I mean, I think for me, more than investments, the, the world where I work is... And the project that I, the projects that I'm working on more than say typical investments are actually sort of developer incentive programs, mm -hmm. developer award programs and grants. And as I mentioned, we, we as a foundation or based on feedback from the ecosystem, we started working on a project called Sorbonne, which is a smart contracts platform that will plug into Stellar. And in October, we launched it on a, a the FutureNet, which is a developer like sandbox network. And it's slated to launch on mainnet in the second half of this year. And between now and then, our goal is basically to bootstrap an entire smart contracts ecosystem. And so in order to do that, we announced that we have allocated hundred million to, to spur Sorbonne adoption. That is money that will be distributed through a series of programs over a series of years. 
And already we've launched the first three of those programs. We started, and they sort of each targets a different layer of developer engagement. So first there's a thing called Stellar Quest, which is for learners. It's a gamified intro to Stellar. You can go play it right now and it will sort of show you how to use Sorbonne and in, you can enter into competition with other developers to sort of show your chops. It's fun, great way to learn. Like sort of after that, there's a thing called Sorbonnethon. Sorbonnethon is essentially small awards for content creators. So you tinker with Sorbonne, you experiment, you leave feedback, you write content, you write tutorials, you even raise issues on GitHub. This helps us like sort of create the content that, that, that onboards new developers. And it also helps us to get feedback as we continue to actually refine the Sorbonne platform between now and mainnet launch. And then the third one is that Stellar Community Fund. It's a fund that's been around for a long time, but this year we actually turbocharged it, right? So we mega ultra supersized it. It's running every month now. It is giving away a lot more money. Our goal this year is to try to distribute through that fund $10 million to developers. It essentially is looking to give away a high volume of grants to people that are building, that are sort of first to market building proofs of concept on Sorbonne in order to start to bootstrap the Sorbonne ecosystem. And like the outcome that we're looking for, which is ambitious, is by the time we get to mainnet launch, for there to be a sort of minimum viable Sorbonne ecosystem. All of the things that, that are necessary to, con to grow a smart contracts ecosystem that already exists other places, we want them to exist in this ecosystem. And so we're very at a very like giving away high velocity, high volume grants to a lot of different projects to bring them in and sort of de-risk the cost of them building in a new ecosystem and to help them start to build those crucial experiments. And so those three things, Stellar Quest for learners, Sorabonathon for tinkerers and content writers, and SCF for builders are like the first three programs that we've launched as part of the larger Sorabon Adoption Fund. I'm pretty excited about it because I think no matter who you are, you can engage in one of those programs and you'll have some structure to start to work in this new smart contracts ecosystem, you'll start, you'll be able to experiment with the technology. It's a very welcoming community. It's very fresh. And there's an opportunity here to be like sort of first to market in this particular ecosystem, building all of the, the dApps and DeFi protocols, tools, and educational resources. And I think the very cool thing is that when Sorbonne launches, it will connect to classic Stellar, right? So that story I was telling you before about Stellar has these on and off ramps, including cash in with MoneyGram. Now put DeFi in the middle of that, and you can build these DeFi projects that essentially allow people to access them via cash in. So there's a very exciting inflection point right now where we are able to attract a new sort of strata of developers and where we are moving very quickly to give them the structure and support to try to, to, to be a part of this new Greenfield ecosystem. Mm, that's awesome. I'm curious on the community fund. Is that a fund that is a like a sub fund of SDF, where it's a portion of the foundation's money went into this, and then that's like, w w w yeah, what is it exactly? What's the purpose of it? Yeah, if you go look at the mandate page that I, I, I feel like I keep mentioning it, but if you go look at the Stellar.org/slash/foundation/slash/mandate, you'll see that there are specific buckets. One of them is called ecosystem support, and ecosystem support is a grant allocation that doesn't belong to S SDF. It is earmarked to give out to various grant programs, and there are several that sort of draw from that bucket, and SCF is one of them. It's, it's the biggest one right now. So it is again, it's it's a very clearly earmarked, tracked, transparent source of funds that we are sort of giving out in public to the, to, through this open application grants program. That's awesome. So, so the process, if I'm on the development side, say I'm me, a few other developers working in blockchain, we're really interested in this. We want to win the grant. What is, what is the process both? What are you looking for from the, from the grant perspective, from the funds perspective? And then what is a developer, what should a developer know as to what's happening behind the scenes? It's like, is it you and three other people that review these things once a week and then every month you'll pick the best one or like how, what are you looking for? And then what's happening behind the scenes to make the decisions on the grants? Good question. If you are interested, go to communityfund.stellar.org and all the information is there. I mean, there's just, again, it's very transparent. There's a ton of information about what we're looking for. There's an application, there's a submission form for the grant that will walk you through the exact requirements in order to submit ask you very specific questions that will help you submit an application that meets those requirements. And there is also like a handbook 
that explains the selection process, the approval process, the sort of the eligibility requirements, like everything that you need to know is literally written out in great detail. At a high level, like right now, the SCF supports offers awards to like any eligible project that's helping to expand the Stellar or Sorbonne ecosystems. Currently, we are is one of the main focuses is to bootstrap this minimum viable Sorbonne ecosystem. So like the, the, the things that are necessary for a blockchain ecosystem to actually exist to be to so that people can continue to build on it, the tools, the, the sort of building blocks, the protocols, the dApps, the educational resources, all of those are in scope for the, for the, for the, uh, SCF, the Stellar Community Fund. And so if you want to build any of those things, you can go there and find out. On the back end, the grants are, are quick turnaround. So there's a deadline every month. The review process, once the deadline closes, takes about a week, I think. And it involves like basically a, a selection panel of, of people that are drawn from both within the foundation, but also from the broader stellar community. Anyone can join that panel. There's, there is a, it's, it's, you have to sort of be qualified. It's a verified panel. So it, but the. The requirements for joining are also very transparent and they're, you, you basically need to have contributed in one way or another to the stellar, mm -hmm. to sort of the stellar ecosystem. And so it's, it's a review panel that goes through those and it, it allocates awards based on if they meet the sort of qual qualifications to give out those awards. And at the moment, again, the goal is if you imagine that these are grants in, if we're, if I'm saying, okay, we're trying to allocate where our goal is to give away about $10 million worth of grants in this year. And the grant size, the grants are designed to sort of cover the costs, development costs for say two to three months, right? So the grants are on average about say $100,000 worth of lumens. That's a lot of grants, right? That's, that's 100, 100 grants in a year. So there's a lot of opportunity for a lot of people to come and, 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 and apply for those grants. There's, there are a lot of awards to go out and definitely it will be pretty high volume. But again, I think it's things that help grow the Stellar and Sorbonne ecosystem, specifically like these sort of minimal requirements for a thriving ecosystem for Sorbonne over the next six months. And they are there to cover the, the development costs for two to three months for a, a team of developers. They are not intended to, to cover operational costs or to be like super long-term. It's like, let's, let's help you get started. Let's de-risk those development costs. Let's Let's get you experimenting. So I think it's when you show up, it's very important that you have a definitive project with a clear scope in mind. Gotcha. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about any of the other projects that you've recently funded? Or if not, I'm curious to learn a little bit more about how the how projects that have been funded in the past are going and, and what have been some of the most successful investments that the fund has helped create. Yeah, I mean the the this fund it's it's no strings attached, so it's not it's not an investment where there's where you give up any equity. Like it mm -hmm. is definitely like funds that help defray the cost of development, and that's an important point because we're not asking applicants to give us any right other than a well scope yeah, I, proposal. But but the this will be the thirteenth round of the SCF, and most of them predated the 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 plans to launch Sorbonne. So many of them were projects that were built on classic Stellar. To date, those projects have done things like we've helped support the main block explorer on Stellar, a network visualizer that helps you understand sort of the, the, the network topology, SDKs that we don't maintain, but that others do have, have gotten kickstarted through SCF. So that's all tools. Then there's like mm -hmm. applications. So Lobster, which is probably the, the most commonly used Stellar wallet. I think Stellar X, which is the exchange interface, like the, the grant recipients have built applications. There's a lot of sort of like applications that have been designed to enable cross-border payments or to serve specific users in specific markets have also launched. And I think, I think for this round, I, we are about to announce the first sort of SCF grants for this year, but I don't, I don't want to scoop it. So I can't, I don't think I can talk about any of those specific sure. projects, but I think we'll be announcing those quite soon. And the current round of, of applications submissions is open till March 13th. And so I think, again, the, the SCF of the past, the first 11 rounds that happened in, in the years previous were, um, they, they were, they were a bit, they, they didn't happen as quickly and they were all for sort of classic stellar projects. 
the current rounds are, hap- you know, again, it's sort of turbocharged, so it's happening faster and, and it's focused on this Sorbonne ecosystem development. So I think that what will happen next will relate in a lot of ways to like what's happened in the past, but it will be, the new crop will be somewhat different. And mm. yeah, I, I wish I could tell you more about the projects that are about to win. Are, 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 you, are you concerned about the, the issue I brought up earlier with like people submitting projects and given that you're going to make a hundred in a year, that's two a week. That's basically one every two and a half business days. Yeah, like are pe- like how, like clearly developers have they could just go around to multiple projects, submit something that looks good, and then never build anything. A hundred k to a lot of people is worth their time to make a nice proposal. How do you mitigate that? Like, yeah, I think that that's a really no? good and difficult question. I think there's a couple answers. First of all, breakage is normal. I think a certain amount of grants that you give away will not have the impact that you want. And the question really isn't how do you make them all have impact. It's how do you get enough bang for your buck, right? Like right. If, if a certain percentage of people are just kind of like graspers and they don't actually build something useful, but you do get useful things out of a program, it might just kind of be the cost of, of doing business. The ultimate yeah. question is what's, are you getting the outcome that you want? Not are you preventing like sort of people from abusing the system? So I'd say for us, that's what we focus on more than anything is like, are we getting high quality projects through that then continue on to actually create great benefit for the ecosystem? And I think generally the answer is, is it's worth it. But second, I think that the selection and review process, like it does involve the community. So people that tend to be successful in getting these awards have some sort of credibility, often a history with the community. And so they're not, there is some work that you do to like sort of build up that credibility. And that does defray some of the like people from, from abusing the system. Third, in this specific round of SCF, it's again, it's set up to sort of allow people to, to develop. And when you submit, you actually submit some, some deliverables here, here are the five things that we want to do. And when you get the first award, you actually, you specify a first deliverable, right? You say, we're, we want to build it, it, maybe it's just like a proof of concept, right? We want to build a proof of concept of whatever it is that we're talking about. That's our first deliverable. You essentially get 10% of your award. You complete that deliverable. It should take about two weeks. Then you say, we've completed our de- deliverable and the selection panel actually looks again and says, did they complete it? It's, it's a proof of intent, right? So have they proved their intent to actually build by completing a deliverable? And this is new. So we don't actually know if this works, but the idea is for it to be a lightweight gate so that like it reduces, like you actually have to complete something to, to get the full award. And so, but, but it's not super onerous, right? It's not, it's you basically say, here's what I want to build. And then you say, I built it. And then you get the 10% to do that first thing. And you get the, you can sort of re reapply for the remainder once you've actually completed it and you get it. If and only if like the, the selection panel reviews that deliverable and it, is basically like, yeah, you did it. So it, I think it's going to work, but we'll see. Have you ever thought about like, I was always interested in the, in the business model of 99 designs. Have you ever seen that company? It, yeah. It's like the logo one. Like you basically say like, Hey, I'm Justin. I'm starting a barbershop. I want a logo. I want it to be blue and whatever you describe it. And then does, it's like an open bid where it's like a, okay, I'm willing to pay 300 and then designers anywhere could submit their logos. And then whoever you pick wins the prize. And, and so it's like this, there's like some, some, like the transact, the, the, what would you call it? It's like the, the cost of figuring out the right logo is on the creators. So mm-hmm. they're all about just creating a lot of logos and trying to really narrow in what you're looking for. And if they win the, win the bid, they win the money. And I, and I, it, it almost seems like, could that work here where it's like, okay, there's a bid. The ecosystem is, is looking for, like, we want some app functionality to do something. Right. And it's described and like, okay, this is our bid, whoever can build it and whoever gets sufficient community voting to approve that you've met this, the satisfaction of the, of the proposal gets the money. So instead of like submit the proposal, we give you money, you go build. Could it be like, this is what the community wants, whoever, multiple people can try to build it. And then whoever builds it first to the level that, that is met by the criteria of the project gets the money it like as a re- it's like a reward instead of a grant is that does that make sense have you tried that or thought about that that does make sense and it is the kind of thing that we think about like i think that that when we are 
thinking about these like sort of the stellar community fund in, in general in particular but like community fund community informed funding in general there's always a question of like yeah how do you how do you make it efficient how do you get the best participation how do you make it so that like you're both encouraging the community to weigh in and using their opinion to like evaluate and and distribute awards as well as how do you make sure that those awards are actually effective at, at sort of helping the ecosystem to grow those are all really really big questions and i'll say i i like your idea and for me we what i've described is the uh, about sort of the functioning of, of scf the st the community fund is like how it works right now but every single time that we run it we do iterate and we say okay we're gonna try a new i mean in conjunction with the community we say all right what what worked we just did a round what worked that round what did it how should we modify the process and we get a lot of feedback and there's a pretty collaborative environment where, where we get a lot of, where, you know, people share ideas like the one that you just had, right? And we start to get feedback on whether we should try to implement them. And oftentimes we will try something new for a new round and see what happens. Right now there is, there's actually a big discussion about how to continue to like sort of improve the voting mechanisms for SCF and something like what you described, I think it is the, is the kind, that's the kind of discussion that people are having. For me, I'd say right now, like we are so early, especially in the Soroban ecosystem that like I, we, we really want, it's kind of like a more is more approach. We want as we are really, really trying to like capture attention and interest and get a lot of people building. That's true because we want to have a lot, like we don't just want to have like a sort of like a, I'll say like. That's true because we want to have a lot of different, we want to open the opportunity for people to participate and have a lot of different people who are trying and knowing that some will succeed and some will fail. And we can't always reason about who will, like in the beginning. I don't even think the people who are building will know all the time if they're actually going to succeed or fail. It's also true right now because there's this notion of you've, you've got a new planet to explore and, and a budget to do it. And you can send up one rover, right? One Mars rover. Yeah. And you spend a trillion dollars on the rover and it's fully tricked out and you think it can do everything that you want it to do. You park that rover. I don't know. There's a crash landing. It ends up on the wrong side of Mars or it drives into a ditch first thing or the battery has some unexplained failure and you got nothing, right? Or you can basically take the same rocket payload and put a million tiny little spider robots in it, drop them off on the face of Mars. Mm. Each one just does one little thing, runs until it can't run anymore, then it throws up a flag. It looks to see if there's oxygen in the soil and it throws up a flag. And you sort of through that method, fast, cheap, and out of control method. I'm, I'm stealing this from a movie called Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control. Like through that <laughs> method, right? You essentially, you're not putting all your eggs in one basket, so to speak. Like you are basically saying a lot of people, a lot of small things, a lot of small effort sometimes is a better approach to exploring a world than like one big, well-reasoned Mars rover. And so I think for now, we need that, that, we need a million robots, not like a million little spider robots, not like one super well-defined Mars rover. And that may change, but a lot of the way the community fund is like sort of designed at the moment is to facilitate that exploration, that experimentation, multiples. Mm, I like that a lot. I'm also tangentially, I'm a really big fan of sending out like from a like space exploration perspective, I'm a really big fan of sending out like 10,000 Voyagers, which are the small satellites, and sending just spray those things all over. And instead of investing 30 years into like the James Webb or the Hubble and then having that be all our eggs are in that, that thing better work. And it's great that it's up there and it's great that it worked, thank God. But it's like the Hubble almost didn't. And I just think the idea of exploring, like if you kind of look at nature, like plants, when they, when they explore new ground, we have these, these plants, in my front yard, they're like, they have 50,000 different little tentacles that go around and they explore using that. And it makes more sense. You're the analogy of explore via a, a ton of small bets. That's how seed funding works. I mean, if you're a seed investor, you don't know what's going to work, what doesn't. So you make a bunch of small bets. And the, the more confident you are, the, the later stage funding you are by analogy and, and company investing the more you can invest so it, it does it does make a lot of sense i do really like that idea of flipping it though like here's the proposal whoever builds it gets the prize i yeah i i'm i'm not opposed to that i say i say let's explore it that's the kind of feedback we yeah. want 
Because that's the other thing, right? Is that I, I think going back to your earlier question, like, okay, well, what have we learned as a foundation, right? What, what, what would we do differently? I think part of it is like blockchain as an industry is still young and the, the, we're still sort of looking for best ways that it can impact the world. We're still trying to attract talented minds to actually participate and build cool stuff. The potential's there, right? But there's no, there's still a lot of experimentation to do to figure out like what actually works. And so, yeah, I'm all for like trying every idea. I mean, not every idea, trying every idea, every, every decent idea and seeing, seeing what happens. I, I think I yeah. said like earlier, like I, I, I started as, as a musician, right? Like I was, I was in a band, I wrote songs and I just like know that when you're, when you're in that world, you get up every day and you try to write a song and then you may succeed. If you wake up and you only try to write hit songs. You'll never write a song and you'll never write a hit song. Like you write a hundred songs, one of them might be a hit. You write, try to write one hit song, you'll maybe write one song and it probably won't be a hit. And it's just like, you have to sort of like come up with processes that allow you to, that, that, that allow you to, to like sort of fail a lot in order to succeed. But you can't like explore oh, specify. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like you can't just reason about what success, if you just knew exactly what to do, like life would be so easy. And, and. But, but, you know, you don't, right? Like, like there's so much of it is like, I'm trying to figure out what the next, right, what the, what the right things to do are. And in a, in an industry like blockchain, where there's just like not a ton of actual success or failure data, I mean, it's probably true in any industry, but certainly in blockchain where there's not a ton of success or failure data, I think it's really good to be able to like run experiments because one of them might be a hit. It's hard to know which until you try. Yeah, I love it. I told you I'd get you out of here in an hour, and I, I definitely want to. I want, I just so curious to hear your thoughts on like a lot has changed in crypto over the last year. Mostly like a huge spike, and then kind of a depressive collapse and all sorts of stuff. How do you view our current condition today? Do you view it as hey, it's just the technology itself is great. It that wasn't the thing that broke. It was people, and there's been a lot of like depression in the prices, but still the technology is, is flourishing and we just need to like build it now. And then there'll be this reemergence of useful technology or, or do you have a different perspective on where we are as like a collective of, of builders and in, in decentralized technology space? Yeah, I think the last year has been a setback for the industry and I think it creates a whole new slate of challenges. I think we've lost sort of credibility as an industry. We've lost the faith of the public. We've invited with good cause the scrutiny of, of legislators and regulators. There are a lot of questions. And I believe that the underlying technology is, is actually something that is, can be used for good, should be used for good, has a lot of potential, but that it's, there's a lot of work to do to like sort of differentiate the good parts and disambiguate the good parts from the problems. There's a lot of work to do to educate people about why certain aspects, why decentralization, for instance, is important and why you, when you sacrifice it for centralization, that is what often leads to, to many problems. And also to actually build like say consumer interfaces or give consumers or even businesses, but basically users of, of any kind of decentralized technology, a user experience that is somewhere has some sort of parity with like more centralized interfaces. So I think there's, there's education sort of confidence building and rebuilding faith. And then also like sort of creating technologies or creating interfaces or ways for people to interact with blockchain that, that are, that have better user experience. And like all those things are necessary and they all involve like thinking and building and differentiating what is good about blockchain and distributed ledgers from the, the problems that, that, that sort of arose in the last year for me. And, and so I think it's a challenge, like for me in my role. And at the foundation in general, we have only ever been focused on utility, right? We've always talked about real world use cases. We've talked about building applications that make sense. We have talked about our mission, right? To increase equitable access to the world's financial infrastructure. We have supported and talked about and engaged with actual products that have purpose for consumers, for end users, for the world. And so I think for us, we're, we're just like continuing to focus on the things that we've always focused on. As an industry, I think a lot of people are starting to say to do that as well. And I think by continuing to do that, we can sort of solve those problems, better interfaces, restore faith, 
educate. It's just, yeah, it's, it's I feel like we've lost a little ground. It's going to take a while to get it back. Yeah. Yeah. I hope you're, I hope you're right that it's a little ground. That's my biggest oh. hope is that it's not a, it's not a step bad like the, like the psychedelics in the sixties where it's just like banned for 50 years, hoping that the government does a responsible job and, and maturely regulating the space as opposed to cracking down on it and viewing it as a threat. Yeah. It, yeah. So hundred percent supportive of what you guys are doing, Josh, Justin, thanks so much for, for spending your time with me and yeah, congrats on all the progress so far. I hope you guys continue to, to fund great people and great projects. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. It was fun.